It's like magic, isn't it? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here tonight. I'm Thoda Klo. I'm the executive director of the Foundation for the National Archives, which is in partnership with the National Archives in terms of their educational outreach. And, and I must say, we're proud partners. It's my honor to welcome you all this evening to the seventh annual William G. McGowan Forum on Communications called What's Next in the Social Media Revolution. Now, for those of you who are following along in the program, we do have a couple of small changes. First of all, I get to welcome you first. And then, unfortunately, uh, Sue Jean McGowan was not able to join us tonight, but she, along with the Board of Directors of the McGowan Fund, send their greetings to all of you. And it will be my pleasure to introduce the wonderful work that our foundation, the McGowan Fund, and the Archives has been able to accomplish together. So it was many, many years ago, a long time, about eight years or so, we described our plans to work with the National Archives to the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. We were working to create a new public face for the National Archives that we were going to call the National Archives Experience. This would include a new, a new museum space in this building, along with permanent and traveling exhibitions, and educational programming and online initiatives. These activities would then be supported by marketing campaigns, special events, publications, and records-related products. All of this with the goal to reintroduce the vast depth and diversity of the records of the National Archives to the American people and help explain the importance of the agency to an engaged citizenship. And I hope that most of you have been able to get up and see some of the great things that we've been able to accomplish both here and online. So the family of the late Bill McGowan and especially his wife, Sue Jin McGowan, got very excited about participating in this project and especially about our ongoing public programs. They supported this beautiful state-of-the-art theater and thanks to the generos their generosity, we were able to open the theater in 2004. But the McGowan Fund had no intentions of stopping there. They have, con they have continued to support the theater's significant and enlightening programming, including panel discussions on historic topics, as well as issues of the day, author lectures and film screenings, all of which are presented free to the public. The McGowan Fund also has worked with our foundation in the National Archives to create this annual McGowan Forum on Communications, which is really a fitting tribute to Bill McGowan's legacy. We are so proud of this partnership, and we want to thank the fund for its ongoing support. I also want to thank the talented and dedicated public programming staff at the National Archives under the leadership of the Archivists of the United States who work hard to provide an incredible calendar of programming in this beautiful theater. And every year they devote themselves to developing this annual forum, delving into timely topics in communications and technology. We at the Foundation are so proud to work with the Archivist and all of our partners at the National Archives, and we want to thank you for your support and friendship. So now another change in the program, I get to introduce the Archivist of the United States. David Ferriero comes to the Archives with plenty of experience in encouraging social media and other web-based initiatives at large cultural and educational institutions. From his early days at the Duke University and the MIT libraries, through his most recent role as director of New York Public Library, David has been a leader in the digital revolution. At the New York Public Library, David was part of the leadership team responsible for integrating the four research libraries and 87 branch libraries into one seamless entity for users. In addition, he was in charge of the library's digital experience and strategy tools that he has brought here to the National Archives leading our digital charge. David is our first archivist to blog and to tweet. So enjoy his comments. Look for his blog on archives.gov. 
But in the meantime, we have him here live in person, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to introduce the 10th Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Thank you, Thoda, and I want to add my welcomes to all of you. Welcome to my house this evening. Um, my thanks also to the McGowan Fund for making this possible, and especially my thanks to the Foundation for the National Archives for all the work that they do. And if you're interested in becoming a member of the Foundation for the National Archives, there are applications for membership out in the lobby. The Foundation supports all of our outreach and exhibition activities and provide us much uh, needed support. And if you have not been to our shop recently, physically or virtually, please do so. We have a wonderful new line of product uh, associated with our exhibit on What's Cooking Uncle Sam. So I am personally very excited about tonight's program. Um, as you know, we are the nation's record keeper. And we have our eye on the past and on the present, but increasingly on the future. And as such, we're responsible for providing guidance on the records implications of new and emerging technologies to the 275 federal agencies and to the White House. For the past two years, we have been working furiously to bring ourselves up to speed on Web 2.0 platforms, become facile in what is currently available, and have developed a sense of curiosity, but more importantly, a sense of excitement about technologies as vehicles for connecting our clients, especially the American public, with the records of this country. And I hope you had a chance to take a peek at some of the um, exhibits that were outside, some of the demonstrations, and that gives you a little flavor of some of the things that, that we have been able to pull off already. So our great panel deserves a very special moderator, and we're very, very fortunate to have landed Alexander B. Howard, the Government 2.0 correspondent for o O'Reilly Media, O'Reilly Media. In addition to O'Reilly's radar, you'll find Alex on Huffington Post, um, GovFresh, Mashable, ReadWriteWeb, and Forbes, to name just a few. Alex is a graduate of Colby College, and after a variety of interesting employment adventures, made the big move to DC in 2009, and in his words, with, a, with his Greyhound, fiance, power tools, plants, and growing collection of cast iron pots. But what you really need to know about Alex is that he has 876 Facebook subscribers, 596 people in his Google Plus circle, and 12,839 people have him in their circles. But most importantly, he has 1, 102,893 followers on Twitter. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alex Howard and the panel. I'm, I'm <clears throat> very glad to see all of you here. Uh, and it's really exciting to connect a lot of faces that I know online, offline. Uh, I am privileged to be sharing the stage with the three people to my right. Uh, if you have these programs, you can see their wonderful uh, eminent backgrounds. But I will point them out, uh, stage left to stage right. We have Pamela Wright, who is the Chief Digital Access Strategist for the National Ar Archives and Records Administration. We have David Weinberger, who writes about the effect of the internet on ideas. I like to refer to them as my favorite internet philosopher. And we have Sarah Bernard, who is pinch hitting for Macon Phillips. She's the Deputy Director for the White House Office of Digital Strategy. Thank you so much for stepping in for him. So uh, with that, uh, I'm actually going to uh, keep it short as is the way these days with social media, and uh, move directly uh, to uh, Pamela, who's going to talk about some of the, or the work that the uh, National Archives is doing uh, with social media and with open government. Thank you, Alex. Good evening. Let me uh, make sure I have this right. OK. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here tonight um, to talk with you. Uh, the presentation I'm about to give you, um, I don't know if any of you listen to NPR, but they have this This I Believe segment. And when you listen to that, you always think, gosh, what would I write or what would I say if it was This I Believe? 
this um, presentation is probably as close as I'm going to get to this, I believe. So, so here we go. I'm very pleased to tell you tonight that one day, all of the records of the National Archives will be available online. With 10 billion pages in our holdings, that is the big, hairy, audacious goal that we've set out, um, and that introduces our Citizen Archivist dashboard. This is an, is an example of what's next for the National Archives. The dashboard is currently under development. We hope to launch it in early December, uh, but tonight I have the honor and the privilege to preview it for you. The principles of open government, transparency, participation, and collaboration are embedded in the mission of the National Archives and the work that we do every day. We took a good look at our work and how it relates to open government, and we developed our first open government plan in 2010. With the in introduction of the term citizen archivist by the Archivist of the United States in April of 2010, uh, we began exploring ways to leverage the expertise and enthusiasm of online volunteers. You know, the National Archives actually has had um, an evolving view of social media since we started to dip our toes in the water in 2009. Originally, we started with pilot projects and gave uh, a lot of staff reassurance that we could pull the plug at any moment if anything went wrong. Many staff were skittish about the dangers that lurked in the wilds of social media. So from the safe and secure island of archives.gov, we sailed forth into social media using our pilot projects as little speedboats to go out there. First, we started with Flickr, and then we went on to Facebook, and then we went on to Twitter. And there was this huge surprise that nothing terrible happened. And we actually connected with people. So we kept going. And as we learned from these initial projects, we developed policies and processes to develop programs and continue our efforts. We count likes, comments, reblogs, all of these being signs of engagement with the public. But now we're looking even deeper uh, for even deeper levels of engagement. So let me give a quick example before I uh, demo more of this. We have a Wikipedian in residence on staff, Dominic McDevitt Parks, and I think he's in here somewhere. I know I saw him earlier tonight. He started with us in May, um, and he's been working on our staff to upload digital copies of our records from our online catalog into um, the Wikimedia um, Commons, and also then to uh, Wikisource and ultimately to Wikipedia. Since May, one student, uh, he isn't, hasn't even been full time, has put in 90,000 records into Wikipedia. So we kept going. Um, so the, uh, he has also uh, brought local Wikipedians into our buildings, taking behind the scenes tours. These people come in on Saturday and look at records uh, that we have. We're talking a dedicated group of people that are interested in the history of the United States and work with us on scanning projects to digitize our records. It's an incredible uh, marriage of um, collaboration with the public, and it's that level of engagement that we're looking for. We also want to build that level of engagement with our online tools. And last summer, thanks to the leadership of the National Archives, we had a tagging feature added to our online public catalog. We have about a, uh, over 1,000 tags in it already. Um, and people can tag up uh, anything they want, and we we're trying to have a low barrier to use. So we have a very light registration, and then you can go in and tag. Those tags can be included in the search to provide better responses to search inquiries. So we constantly are trying to improve our products. At NARA, we now understand that crowdsourcing activities using social media tools aren't fluff. It isn't gravy. It isn't the extra stuff that we do but rather it plays a vital role in how citizens participate in and with the government. This is getting at participatory democracy in new and exciting ways. When we make a call to action, we are demonstrating a government that is truly of, by, and for the people. As a portal for citizen archivist activities um, of the National Archives, the Citizen Archivist Dashboard will promote specific crowdsourcing initiatives designed mainly for the general public. We just want people that are interested. We don't want to make it complicated. But also some specific groups of researchers and what they might want to do. The Citizen Archivist Dashboard is meant to pull together and centralize information about all our different crowdsourcing activities that are available on a variety of sites. And as a portal, the dashboard will help in promotion efforts, elevate visibility of citizen archivist activities, and encourage dialogue around the development of future activities. In fact, this is kind of our stake in the ground, and it's just the beginning of what we'd like to develop. So I just want to take you uh, through 
the different pages of the, the dashboard. We begin with tagging, and like I said, um, uh, the dashboard pulls this together, so you can tag on projects that we have currently in Flickr. We have about 10,000 images in Flickr that you can work with. We already have tens of thousands of tags in there, but we also want to direct people to that. And then our on online catalog. We'll have additional tagging missions through this portal page uh, that we're developing right now. The transcription page. So tagging is a fairly um, low-level activity, easy to do. If you're a little interested in, in doing a little bit more, you can help us transcribe, transcribe some of our records. So as I said, our Wikipedia and residence has already uploaded some to Wikisource, which is the, the product of the Wikimedia Foundation in which you can do transcription. Um, and they have a very sophisticated set of tools to be able to do transcription there. But we've also decided to try a pilot, a transcription pilot um, at the National Archives. This pilot encourages citizens to contribute transcriptions of the documents that are coming out of our catalog. So one of the neat things about social media that I see our agency doing is uh, leveraging the work over the last decade that we've pulled together to put description and digital copies online and then repurpose those, reuse those, and, and put those out where people live. So we selected about 300 documents uh, with about 1,000 images. And let me show you. This is what the tool looks like. The um, documents are organized into three categories based on our impression of how much effort it would take uh, to actually transcribe the documents. So we've got the beginner is green. And uh, those tend to be shorter in length, easy to read. Some are even a little bit um, have some type in them. And there's very few complications. So if you just want to try a little bit, you can try a beginner. The intermediate is longer, of course, and then the advanced are really long, complicated. I'm telling you, there's handwriting that's very difficult to read um, in some of these. So you can browse by keyword, by level of difficulty, um, transcription status or date. And I'm just going to pick uh, the intermediate one to show you a little bit closer. This is a close-up of a letter. Um, and you can see at the top, we have a, a Zoom um, section for the transcription. That's vital for handwriting, if any of you have looked at handwriting online. If you can't zoom and look in, it's very difficult. And then below, we have the simplest possible interface. Um, it's simply a narrative field. And we're asking people very simply, what do you see? And please transcribe um, the letter above. So it's a very simple interface. We're starting with that. We're going to do lessons learned as we go. Let me just tell you about this particular document. It's um, one of three pages. You can see up here. Uh, this is from Record Group 94, Records of the Adjutant General's Office. It was written in 1863. It's a compiled military service record of uh, Samuel Cabell um, of the 55th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment. So the, the first page of the letter is to his mom. And he's telling his mom that um, he joined uh, the regiment and that he's now in the military. So he's breaking it to his mom that he's in the military. <clears throat> and then he asks his mom if, he, if she could pass along a letter to his wife, in which he tells his wife that he's now in the army. And he asks how the sun is and how things are going. But I think uh, you know these are some of the gems that we have. Uh, you know, millions of people see the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution every year. These are the gems that are are lying in wait at the National Archives for someone to transcribe to put that information back into a search product so that when people search for these, they're findable. This is just the last page of that three-page document. So that's the exciting part um, to me of our transcription project. We have 300 documents, 1,000 pages. I don't know how long they'll last, they'll last <clears throat> if people will come in and do them immediately. I have a feeling that they're going to go quick. And so we're already looking at the next set and what we're going to do from there. So other pages on the dashboard include contributing artic articles. This is um, articles that you contribute to our archives wiki, which is one of our, uh, the National Archives wiki. But you can also contribute to Wikipedia. And then another page that is really near and dear to my heart. So uh, every night I go home, and right before I go to bed, I look at Facebook. And I have uh, several friends that are researchers here um, and across the country, actually, at the National Archives. And I also have uh, a staff that are friends on Facebook. And uh, at least once a week, there's somebody who says, oh, look what I found at the National Archives, a gorgeous picture of it well documented what record group it came from. The contextual information is there. 
I want to capture that. I, I'm glad they're putting it on Facebook. I love that they're sharing it. That's exactly what we should do. But I also want to capture that and have it um, as part of our catalog that, you know, that, that there's user contributions to our catalog, and they're identifying and finding some of these great records. Um, so that's what that's all about. Um, we already allow that you know, and have that up on our Flickr. Um, and uh, I want to see us go further with that. I'd love to have an app that they could easily upload. I'm trying to lower the barrier to participating with us. And then the last one is enter a contest. Last year, uh, this is our participation with challenge.gov, and, and, and it's an outgrowth, again, of the Open Government Initiative. Um, and previous contests uh, that we've had are, um, include History Happens Here, which was thought of by one of our students. She was a student at the time. Mary is in the room somewhere. Um, some of the best ideas come from student staff. And um, she uh, came up with this idea of it's kind of um, it's augmented reality in a way. So what we did is in, we invited people to look through our catalog and find a picture that they were interested in and then go to the place where the picture was taken and take a picture of the current with the, with the historical picture within it. We had hundreds of people uh, respond, and the top ones that were chosen were put into a postcard book that we sell now at the, at the shop. So it was a great response. I guess there's a whole group on Flickr that really loves this kind of thing. And it was a great way to get people to engage with our records and have fun um, in our catalog. This year, we have a Document Your Environment contest. This is for students ages 13 through college, if you know anyone. Um, it is uh, in collaboration with the EPA. And what we're doing is um, asking people to look at the Documerica pictures that we digitized, again, 10 years ago. They're in our catalog. We put them up in Flickr. Now you can look at them. There's about 15,000 of them. Um, and be inspired by uh, the pictures. They were taken in the 1970s. The EPA hired um, freelance photographers to capture environmental issues and challenges in the US. And so now we've got this um, challenge to, to take, seek inspiration from those photos and create the next generation of Documerica records. They've expanded a bit, it a bit so that you can do poetry or video as well, and there's cash prizes. So just tell, your, tell the young ones in your life. So what are our next steps? I'd love to gamify the Citizen Archivist dashboard. I'd like people to see, oh, I've done so many transcriptions and where they are um, in compared to their friends. Um, on transcriptions. We'd love to have them earn badges. We'd love scalabil scalability and technical innovations for more sophisticated and complex projects, but this is the stake in the ground to start it. And why are we doing all of this? It's for that transparency, participation, and collaboration um, you know, called for in the Open Government Directive. So, hey, uh, I'm on Twitter. Follow me. I'm Pamela SW. I'll follow you back. <laughs> David Ferriero is D Ferriero on Twitter. I put it up there. And then if you have comments that you'd like to send in, I'd love to hear. We're at opengov at nara.gov. Thank you. Interesting mix of folks. I have to say, this is exciting. You're all looking up as opposed to looking down. If you've been to a number of conferences recently, you know what I mean, right? We all look at each other looking down. But we're all looking down because we're looking for ways to hear what's happening in the back channel. And uh, if you haven't uh, figured it out yet, um, as is almost, I think, necessary to at an event like this, there is a hashtag. Uh, it's McGowan2011. So if you're tweeting in the back channel, you can aggregate your tweets around that. And uh, if you have questions for later on, we're going to open it up later in the program. Please ask them there, and I will ask them. If you want to uh, ask them in person, we have microphones later. So uh, I'm actually really glad that um, the uh, archivist of the United States talked about the imp uh, importance of the past for informing um, the present <coughs> and the future, because uh, that's what I was thinking about uh, when I kind of put a, together a presentation to frame our conversation here, since it seemed like that would be a good idea. Um, so I'm going to try to bring you through the past, present, future of social media in 10 minutes. I'm going to go as quickly as I can because I want to get to talking with them because they're, uh, um, well, quite brilliant and interesting folks. So here we go. Um, so what is social media? Uh, well, you can probably find as many definitions out there as there are people. 
it, it's certainly um, these days, uh, uh, when people think about it, uh, defined almost by the platforms themselves that uh, the, these things exist on. So you think people say, oh, social media is Facebook, or it's Twitter, or it's blogs, or it's wikis, or it's all these different things. Well, let's go back a bit. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back this, this far because I, I don't want to have to put cuneiform tablets on screen. So we're going to start with the Postal Service. Uh, here's the Roman Postal Service. So you can go all the way back there, people uh, sending things back and forth across those great roads. Skip forward, well, a couple millennia. Uh, telegraph, this is a semaphore, right? You can uh, send messages o over vast spaces. Um, pneumatic mail, kind of cool. There used to be vast tubes. You've probably heard the internet is made of tubes. Well, there used to be actual tubes where the bits were pipes. So. Good times. Telephone, here's the first one, looks a little bit differently than, different than the one you carry around, uh, but certainly it was a way of connecting people over vast distances. Radio, here's Mr. Uh, uh, um, I always mess up, Mr. Tesla's tower, uh, as opposed to Mr. Marconi's tower, but uh, Tesla should get a lot of credit for radio. Uh, and then, of course, moving on, we get to email. We skipped ahead a little bit here, but the first emails were sent uh, much longer ago than people realize on that computer. And then there's this ARPANET thing, right? The, the progenitor of the internet we are on today, uh, 40 plus years ago now, uh, people were sending messages back and forth using something called Telnet, uh, certainly reciprocal messaging. We could call that kind of social media, right? Um, commercial online services, actually, this stuff's pretty old. Uh, people have been sending messages online a long time before, uh, well, I was born. Um, and of course, people had some fun with trying to explain that to uh, what would you do online. Um, this started to get democratized a little bit more uh, in the late 70s. Uh, bulletin bo a bulletin board service was the first thing I dialed into. You made that awful dial-up sound. You can go on and, and find things there. Usenet was one of the first places you started to see communities grow up around topics. Uh, chat rooms came not that long after. And then we had fun things that started to come out of other parts of the world. Internet relay chat, uh, which then spawned all kinds of IM not long after. And then this fellow. This is Tim Berners-Lee. Um, he created uh, the World Wide Web on a Next box. Uh, one of the things that the world was reminded of recently when Steve Jobs passed is that his company made the computer the web was born on, which is a pretty nice, neat piece of trivia. Uh, first blog, most people say it's this fellow Justin in 1994 at Swarthmore College. Lots of people followed thereafter. Uh, for a long time, we had to cobble that sort of thing together with HTML on a server, but more followed. Uh, Wikis also came along that year, inspired by uh, Apple's HyperCard, but there's certainly lots of other people thinking about how to link lots of documents together. Um, Tim Berners-Lee took that concept forward. And then AOL, boy, we got a lot of mail and a lot of CDs on our, for our doorsteps. Uh, social networks, well, the first one, Six Degrees, back in 1997, long before there was a Facebook. Uh, file sharing, that kind of got to be a big deal with Napster and Sean Fanning and those uh, folks. Um, then you get to when uh, blogging got really big because it made it, uh, people made it easier to do. Uh, Evan, Ev Williams gets to say he changed the world twice, once a blogger, now Twitter. Of course, he's going off to do other things now and he's my age, so who knows what he's going to do next. But these platforms made it easy for, other, for people to write online. You no longer had to know HTML and be able to stick files onto a file server and know what FTP was and all this other geeky stuff. You could just go to these pages, sign up, and publish things. That started to change things. Then Wikipedia, we heard more about Wikipedia. This has obviously since grown a whole lot since then. It's one of the top 10 websites in the whole wide world. RSS, really simple syndication. Uh, that is one of the ways that people can subscribe to stuff online. It's one of the basic pipes. Friendster, I don't know if you all remember Friendster. I do, I was on there. Technically, I have a profile, but it's pretty cleaned out now. It's still popular overseas, mostly a gaming thing now. MySpace, oh boy, was that a big deal. Still kind of is, right? Millions of, millions of people are there, but other networks have come along. Um, Second Life, I don't know if you remember the, the big virtual world that was built almost a decade ago, people were excited about. And then 2004, boy, 2004 was the year of the web kind of flipped over a little bit. And people started thinking about it differently. I, I work at O'Reilly Media. That happens to be the place where the term Web 2.0 was, uh, was, was coined, right? So uh, this is the idea that something different was happening. We were no longer at a static web as one we could read and write to. It was one that was more interactive, as one that had uh, this new Ajax thing, right? This uh, uh, asynchronous JavaScript. So you would go to a web page and stuff would change on the web page while you were still there. You could interact with it. That changed a lot. And of course, these new startups came along. The Facebook started up uh, over at Harvard. 
Dig came along, Flickr, which uh, the archives have talked about, and LinkedIn, which of course has since gone public. Um, 2005, YouTube came along. Can you believe it's only six years ago that YouTube was founded? Now think about how big YouTube is. Here's the president, Steve Grove, looking at YouTube, uh, actually within the last year when they was quite involved in the political process. And Twitter. Twitter came around in 2006. It became much bigger in 2007. It's grown and grown since then. And interesting things happen there, like when the White House says hello to the Kremlin. Um, live streaming also came along in 2006. Now we can all be our own TV stations if we have the, uh, the right device and we can still get connectivity and we have enough battery and all these things go right. But if all that goes right, now I can stick my phone up and now I can be TV station and anyone else can tune in. If you were seeing what's happening in the Occupy Wall Street protests with people live streaming from those events, you can see how that changes things. They don't need CNN anymore. Okay. First uh, YouTube presidential debate, kind of a fun moment. Uh, Tumblr came along. The National Archives is on Tumblr. Tumblr has exploded since then. It is now one of the top social networks in the world. All kinds of interesting stuff happening there. MyBarackObama.com, have to talk about that because it became kind of a big factor in the last election. Um, and of course, that other election that happened in 2009. I think this is when a lot of people realized these things weren't just places that you went to talk about your lunch. Not that they ever were, but that's what the media timeline was, right? This is just where banal stuff is happening. And then all, whoa, whoa, wait a second. This was the point where I think a lot of people woke up and realized that YouTube and Twitter and all these different networks were letting people see things they couldn't see any other way and letting people's voices be lifted up in ways they had not been before and let us connect to what was happening, connect with each other around what was happening. And that's an unanticipated, an unanticipated effect. It wasn't just people tracking what, what they were doing or what they were seeing. It was looking at to get together. Uh, Foursquare, speaking of tracking what your friends are up to, you can now connect the location of your phone to the location of where you are in the world and map it out online. Uh, Posteris, kind of an interesting uh, mashup of, of email and blogging and pictures. Um, people don't talk about this very much, I think. In this town, it comes up around the country, not as much, but the fact is, is that when the United States military said social media was okay for its service members to use, it was a big deal. Uh, of course, now we're seeing them use it in all kinds of other ways, including listening to people around the world. Um, big news this year, Google decided to get into the social media game. Um, uh, as uh, David mentioned, I am on there. Uh, I don't think it's going away. Uh, the thing to realize about uh, Google being in coming, Google becoming involved in this space is it is not just about a social network. It is about a social layer for the web. Let me say that again. It's about a social layer for the web. It's not just about going to one place. It's about having social services be tied into everything that Google does. They saw Facebook becoming the place people go online and spend an, uh, an average uh, of half an hour every day, an hour every day for some people, dipping in and out of it during the day. It's grown around the rest of the world. It is the stickiest place online. Uh, and that activity is all happening within Facebook. Google responded, and now the two of them are trying to become social destinations and social glue for us online. So here's an amazing infographic that uh, um, Jess3, which is a local design firm, and Brian Solis came up with. You can Google it. It's called the Conversation Prism. It ties together all these services and groups them and makes them uh, do wonderful, interesting things. It's very pretty. Um, if you want to get a, get a feel of what's out there, go to that. So here's the fun part, right? Here's where we get to frame the conversation a little bit. We've gone back all the way, and now we're going into the future. First up, other countries are making their own stuff. This is really important to think about. They're making it so they can monitor it and control it in ways they couldn't necessarily do with our stuff. There's reasons they're doing that. Uh, you could call it civilizing the internet. You could call it harmonizing the internet. You can call it all kinds of things. It's not the way we've thought of doing it traditionally, but given the disruption that connected citizenry pose to lots of places, they are creating their own versions of them. Uh, Russia has vContact as well. And we're going to see new fun stuff. We saw that augmented reality picture before. Now there's going to be new social networks springing up that connect where you are with connecting the people around you. You hold up your phone, you hold up a device, you can see what's happening. Uh, there's a, that virtual layer wherever you are. Um, there's going to be some problems here, <laughs> right? Um, if, uh, you, you, if you're locatable online uh, as you walk around, you can bet the marketers and advertisers are going to want to find you. So that's going to be a challenge. Um, we've talked a bit about the open government side here. It's very important to think about how this is going to tie together. Here's a, an, iPod dashboard, an iPad dashboard for the New York Senate. Um, social media will be increasingly integrated into how uh, our legislatures work. 
and as, as they listen to people, as they listen to each other, as they integrate that into their, uh, um, their process, um, we'll be able to do increasingly interesting things whereas, as we work together to see what government is doing, right? To hold up uh, an iPhone app and to see, uh, this is a, a great mock-up from the Sunlight Foundation, a local open government stalwart, uh, mapping out recovery projects. Um, and we'll get to some wacky things, too, that might be a little bit difficult for us. We're going to be faced with some really difficult questions when people die. I think uh, there, there are starting to be a lot more folks who will put their Facebook password into their will. Because if they don't, what happens? They have to negotiate with Facebook to try to get the page memorialized. The, um, the people won't know what happened. There, there, there are all new questions that have now been raised. And when you think about how we're increasingly connected online to offline, they're going to become much more poignant. And in the explosion of all this data, of all this content, we're going to need better filters for it. We're going to need better browsers. We're going to need to think about how we um, connect with our friends, how we uh, 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 really surf through all of that. This is a, a neat mock-up, I think, of Aurora, which is a concept browser from Firefox. And we have to talk about this, too, right? Uh, um, Google decided not to turn to facial recognition because uh, uh, the CEO, Eric Schmidt, thought there might be some real problems around that. Uh, looks like Facebook is going to uh, seriously consider doing this. This happens to be me on a New York City street um, with uh, a, a fun interactive exhibit uh, where I think it's uh, one of the new, new shows, uh, Person of Interest, I believe that's the, the name of it. Um, the bottom line is, though, is it, was, it was acting like it was tracking me. And, uh, at this point, we worry so much about Big Brother because people have read Orwell in 1984. We thought about the surveillance state. The reality is that we're all sharing ourselves online when we go to these places. It's open source. We, uh, the, the AP came out with a story today um, that uh, they have an open source intelligence center that's tracking people's uh, updates and tweets. If they weren't, they probably weren't doing it right. But it is a reminder that we are exposing ourselves, and increasingly, we're exposing each other. Everyone's told a smartphone can take pictures. So mm, maybe, maybe it's not Big Brother, it's Little Brother. It's all of us. <laughs> and then um, we're now living in, going towards this stream. And I'll leave it here as we go forward and talk to the conversation. Um, this is a picture of Al Jazeera's stream. It, it's a, a combination of, of social media, live streaming, uh, and uh, in-person in interviews. Uh, that really matches what's been happening in the, the Middle East region uh, perfectly, I think, as, as a, a new kind of show that integrates the viewers with, um, with people talking on, on screen with a, a, the live back channel. We're gonna, I think this, this is a starting to get towards the future uh, of interactive media, where you integrate all these things together all at one moment, and we try to connect with each other, connect with what used to be known as the audience. And with that, move on to these folks. So, I hope I didn't talk too long there. Uh, I, I thought- it's Dazzling. Uh, yeah. So no, that's great. It, um, I, I think I uh, wanted to t uh, start, start with, with you, David, because uh, I'm sure you, everyone saw that you wrote a great book called uh, Everything is Miscellaneous. And, and it, it got around uh, this idea that increasingly the audience itself is defining where the, the channels are. Uh, is, is that a good way of describing it? Can you talk about what was going on there and, and what you're, you're seeing uh, evolve since then? I, uh, first of all, that was a great 10 minutes. And, and what you're doing is fantastic. So. Um, and you know that's a, that's one pass through. Everything is miscellaneous. It's uh, you know, the, um, especially given the the theme of everything is miscellaneous, there better be lots and lots of different ways of tweeting it. You know, giving the, the tweet version of it. Um, uh, so I actually want to. Um, so one way of approaching this is um, the following. It was, so it's a, a different and very brief sort of contextualization, which is to say what everybody knows, which is. You know, the internet started out as an address space. It's an open address space. Anything could have an address, and you could point at it. And that's it. You know, um, and the web came along, and the web, uh, internet knows nothing about pages. The web knows all about pages and how to link them. Web pages, the web knows nothing about people. Social networks, social media come along, it knows all about people. We're getting an internet of things. Um, we're getting um, uh, an internet of data, thanks to the semantic web and linked open data that maybe we'll talk a little bit about tonight as well. Um, 
And I, I personally hope that the Digital Public Library of America, which was uh, announced here a couple of weeks ago, and with Mr. Ferriero's uh, um, important support, um, there's a hope that that will create a network of, of cultural objects, the sorts of things that libraries deal with. And all of this is wonderful. Um, the social network is especially important because it sets the agenda for everything else because that's, you know, it's not the technology in charge, it's really, except to <laughs> a little bit, um, it's us. And so social media, social networks are hugely, hugely important. And they're important because social media in particular, um, it's, I think it's important to not think of the network as a, um, a medium in the old sense. That is, a you know, medium is that through which a message passes. And there is obviously there's important senses in which the internet is a series of tubes with these canisters of data going through them. That's, you know, that's one level of it. But at the level that humans care about it, um, the net is a medium because we are literally the medium of the net. When we pass um, ideas around or the cat photos or whatever it is that we're moving through the net, it is quite literally going through us. And every time a message moves, that we move a message from one person to our network, we're putting a little of ourselves in that message. It's not just information, it's us recommending that piece of information or saying whatever we're saying about it. Here's something you'll love, you'll, you'll hate, we'll make you angry, you'll laugh, whatever. That's us putting ourselves on the line a little bit. We are quite literally the medium of the internet. We are that through which these things pass and without us it doesn't matter. Which, um, which is why the fact that of the various sorts of networks that are being built on top of the network, you know, the web that knows about pages and uh, the internet of things and all the rest of it, the social network is not only uniquely important because that is the medium through which everything else passes just about, it's uniquely important also because of all those networks, it's the one that we do not own. Somebody else owns it. It's Facebook, it's Google+, Plus, it's, it's uh, all of the different country versions of implementations that Alex talked about. The rest of the internet, the rest of the networks that matter so much to us, that have made the internet into what it is, they're not owned by anybody. Tim Berners-Lee did not take out a patent. He didn't copyright it. He gave it to us. It was a gift. And that gift has made the world what it is now. All of those networks are unowned except the social one. And that is a hugely important problem and risk and danger to all that we have built. But just one more thing I want to say, which is the sense of ownership that I'm talking about here is quite literal. You know, who owns this stuff. But it's also um, less literal, or in some sense maybe more little, literal. It's at least uh, a deeper sense of ownership. That one of the reasons that we love the things that we have built with a passion, we never loved an encyclopedia the way that we love Wikipedia. And it's not just because Wikipedia kicks encyclopedia, other encyclopedias asses. It's because we built it. It's ours. It's ours in that sense that we built it. And so when I see the National Archive engaging in the sort of social media uh, experiments and programs that you're doing, and tagging and, and transcribing all this wonderful stuff, and a, a, a brilliant solution to the problem of scale, the only conceivable solution to the problem of scale, there's too much stuff, you have to open it up. But it's not just that we're gonna get a whole bunch of, of, of moving letters transcribed, it's the National Archive telling us directly, this is ours. This is ours, this, the things in here, the artifacts, the things that we created that we are saving and preserving together as a nation, it's ours. And that's what opening this up to social media tells us directly and frankly and bluntly. And it's, a, it's far more wonderful and moving even than the fact that you are trusting, with us, uh, trusting us to transcribe well and to tag well. So thank you and thank you. Thank you. Now you all know why he's my favorite internet philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 I'm not going to tear up about what we're building. Really I, you know, yeah, it's, I think it's so, appropriate. Uh, when I talk to people from around the country and, and people from other countries uh, about what's happening in social media and government, which is sort of my beat, uh, the White House comes up because y'all are on a lot of social networks now. Uh, the president's campaign account is one of the most followed in the world. Uh, the White House itself has over 2 million Twitter followers. You've got legions of Facebook fans. I think you're on uh, seven or eight different social media platforms. 
Um, what's next for you all as you look towards what the next thing will be for the White House? You've got your own website and all the social media stuff. What are you working on? You know, for us, we will, we are very agnostic about how we're reaching people, how people are communicating to us. The nice thing about, I came from the, pri the private sector, so I don't have to worry about people coming to our own media properties and selling them ads. I'm happy to have a conversation with citizens wherever they are. So if we ever find a community online that we can have an interesting interaction with mm -hmm. and a touch point where we're not already speaking to them, we will go after that. So uh, whenever there is something new, if, if we have the resources and we think that we can dig in and keep doing it, then, then we'll be there. I think for a little bit of context for folks who don't know, uh, to put it in historical, uh, a little history here. So the White House New Media team is the first administration to have a White House New Media Group. Uh, and we represent the White House's presence online, which is separate actually from uh, Barack Obama, the politician and campaigner. So your, your taxpayer dollars are paying for uh, what we're doing for you as an administration. Um, our goals, which, which leads to what you'll see us do in the future, you know, we are trying to, we concentrate on amplification. So part of our role is communications, amplifying and delivering the president's message in new ways as technology changes. So social media is a perfect way to do that. But by the way, we're not afraid of email too. We've got almost a dozen email products out there. I'd send a fax if it was efficient. So we, anything that's changed in communications, we're hopefully on the bleeding edge there. The second piece uh, that we are touching is that, that we care about is just openness. So everything that we can do to keep, to open up the administration so that you know what's going on. And it may be as simple as uh, our ethics guidelines are public. Anyone who visits the White House, that's public. You name it. What isn't public, we're working to get public. Third piece is uh, participation, which is a theme for everyone. So how do, we get, how do we get citizens closer to administration officials? So I think when I think about what's next, not just in terms of where we'll be in social media presences, I'd say the two areas that, have, that are really changing for us in terms of social media is straightforward communication. You know, our press shop uh, in the communications group is not only breaking news through Washington correspondence anymore. You know, we've got our communications director on Twitter occasionally breaking news. As a former Huffington Post person, I'd love to see us break news on our own media every single day, but I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, so communications, it's changing everything. So um, interviews aren't only George Stephanopoulos asking questions to the president, but by the way, it's Steve Grove at YouTube sourcing questions from citizens that we put to the president. Uh, and we've got 20 different flavors of that. So communications is one. I think we'll try to advance in that area, and you'll see more there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second is getting people closer to policy making. Uh, and, and it's actually really, uh, it, it's sort of touching to actually talk about this here at the archives. Our most recent launch, we launched just three weeks ago, a platform to petition the government online. So actually after having toured the archives and seen so many paper petitions, it was really nice to see that we could bring that forward a little bit uh, online. So now, uh, as of a few weeks ago, Anyone can petition uh, whitehouse.gov. It's called We the People. Um, and if you get 25,000 signatures in 30 days, we will respond to you, no matter what it's about. So uh, pretty great stuff. We've already had uh, over a million petitions signed, uh, averaging about 21 petitions or signatures a minute. So it, it feels like we've got an impact. So more, 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 more. Yep. And for uh, people interested in such things, it's uh, whitehouse.gov slash we the people. Thank you very much. It is. we the people on Twitter. There is a Twitter account that goes with it, hmm. since you all are uh, on, on top of that sort of Where thing. Where we talk about our technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, well, that, that's, no, that's we will the, alert uh, you to what we've responded right. to. So if you're interested in something, mm -hmm. we'll let you know. Yeah, there was the, the White House web hashtag where you give feedback on <laughs> your, uh, how, you, how you're doing there. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with a question I was going to ask directly to Macon. 
he said to ask yeah. you anything that uh, oh, good. you know um, that I would <laughs> have asked him. I booted bacon. <laughs> so what do you got? Um, <laughs> so the, you all started doing something which was pretty daring. And I don't see a, a lot of other governments doing. I don't see a lot of other politicians doing. I don't even see a lot of other journalists doing. You're doing something called natively retweeting people. And for those people who aren't aware of, of the convention on, on Twitter, um, when you retweet someone, you reshare their tweet. So uh, Twitter uh, users actually came up with this. Uh, didn't exist in the platform before. It's one of the neat things about Twitter. Hashtags is, are something that people uh, brought from IRC land onto Twitter themselves, and then Twitter adopted them. Um, the retweet is the RT at name, right? It, it, it's a, a share it on. And Twitter said, OK, you all are doing this. We're going to do it too. So they built it into the platform. So in the same way, you reshare uh, a post on Tumblr, or you reshare content on Google+, or you reshare content on Facebook, you retweet something, and it shows, it, it copies the person's tweet and puts it into everyone else's timeline that's following you. Earlier this year, the White House started doing that on its White House account. And uh, that's, that's actually notable. And so the question is, um, what was behind that decision? And what response have you gotten from taking it that step further with actually raising up people's voices, even those who actually were disagreeing with what you're saying? Uh, I Believe it or not, I, it was not as deliberate <laughs> a, and large, <coughs> large decision. And we'll, and there you have it, everybody. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit of an extension of what we're doing online. We do believe in uh, aggregating voices and aggregating points of view, and that's a service in an, in and of itself, and above. Uh, what we may have to say on a topic. So just as we may point to interesting points of view online on our blogs, it's a natural extension to do it on Twitter. Uh, and that's sort of in the native format. How can you do it best? So not really a, a complicated decision for us. OK. A straightforward answer to a, uh, what was a convoluted question. <laughs> uh, so question to you then. Um, as you look towards uh, what's next, you mentioned um, open social networks. And we're, we're in an interesting place now, as you talked about, where um, our public square, the, the internet in the 21st century, uh, particularly social media, uh, is owned by private companies. Um, the, all the networks I just mentioned are private. Um, and uh, the, the US government did not come up with these networks. Where they're not hosting the conversation. It might make people even uncomfortable if they did, potentially. Um, what are some of the, uh, kind of the loose strands that lead you to think there might be potential for open social networks? Is that something we, we should expect to see? Uh, or is, uh, is the status quo the way it's going to be for the next 10 years? Well, I have, I have no idea what the status quo I have no idea what's going to happen okay. about anything. So, uh, I, I, seriously, you know, I, you know, if you'd asked me in 2001, mm -hmm. you told me that uh, this Wikipedia idea, was, I'd say it's ridiculous. It's never going to work. So, uh, yeah, I have no, um, no ability to tell what's going to happen. Um, I, currently, there seems to be almost no interest in uh, open networks. That we are all, since I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands, we're one way or another. Probably all of us are involved in some social network, and some of us in multiple ones. Uh, me too. You know. Um, we're perfectly willing to trade, um, to, to take the, the benefits that uh, these proprietary networks provide, which are substantial. That's why people are spending so much time on, on Facebook and you know, some on Google Plus and, and the like. Uh, we're very happy to take those benefits um, and sort of not pay attention or hope or not care that this data is locked into a proprietary uh, format. There are internet ideologues who think that's a bad idea. Hmm. Um, and there's some practical reasons to think that it's a bad idea. We don't know what's going to happen to Facebook. We don't know what's going to happen to Google. No matter how good they are now, we don't know what they're going to be in five or 10 years. And so there's some very serious practical reasons to be concerned about this. But we get so much benefit from them, it uh, seems to be a reasonable trade. So there is just about, unless somebody wants to contradict me, I see zero market demand for open social networks, or close to zero um, uh, actual demand uh, for that. 
Yeah. It's, and it's too bad. So the cost of it is not simply that in, in five years, you know, who knows what will happen to Facebook or Google Plus. It's that the cost of innovation is, um, is one that we um, bear right now, although it's invisible. It's all the stuff that isn't being invented because the protocols for um, engaging with people socially and uh, having the core sets of services that you need to be able to do that, to know who the person is, a sense of stability, uh, make it a little bit hard to game and the like. Um, since we don't have those things as open protocols, mm. the range of innovation that we're used to on the net doesn't happen. We, the innovations come from at the pace of Facebook and at the pace of Google, two very smart companies, but they're not as smart as all of us put together. And so we're losing, we have lost, this cap uh, possibility of innovation at a rapid uh, pace when we've signed up for the very valuable, useful, wonderful things that the proprietary social networks do for us. It's a hidden cost. Thank you. So you mentioned you log on to Facebook here and there. Yes. Um, and as a, an archivist, uh, I can't help but think you might wonder about whether your stuff might be saved as it goes up there. Um, when uh, we look at what the nation is collectively posting to uh, these networks, it's, it's mind-boggling. I didn't throw up a stat slide because uh, it's, it's there to see. You can see the volume of tweets flowing online. You can see the volume of pictures flowing into Facebook and videos flowing to YouTube. Um, is, uh, the National Archives looks at all of that. Mm -hmm. How do we know what to save and how do we save it? <laughs> right, so that's an issue that the National Archives has been grappling with all along. And uh, uh, the records management um, part of this you know, we issued guidance on, on social media records management specifically in October of 2010 that provided guidance to agencies on how to, how to um, think about archiving these records and their holdings. You know, essentially, you need, it's about the content. So there's so many platforms, there's so many technologies, you know, there's a million things happening um, every day, new ones coming up all the time that it's, not so much about the technology that people need to think about, but the content and whether or not it's a permanent holding. And, and uh, there, I see Arian uh, in our <laughs> in our audience. He's uh, one of the, on the records management team, and he gives um, presentations on this all the time. So bear with me, Arian. Um, so it's really about the content, and the, one of the ideas that um, our records managers tell us within our own agency and talk to agencies ac across the government is to consider the records management implications before you dive into any project, any social media project. So we try to set the example, all of the projects that we work on, all the 66 internal wikis and uh, all of the external blogs, everything that we do, we talk with our records managers about what this content is, how do we save it, what are the things that we need to do. In, in 2010 with our open government plan, um, the chief records officer, um, Paul Wester, along with the archivist, got a group together that, two groups together that had never really talked before, the Federal Records Manager Council and the CIO Council. So we're talking the technology and the records management, which are the two that need to come together to solve these issues. So that's a, that was a start that we did last year, and we continue to provide guidance. Sounds like you are definitely on it. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people are on it, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, we are just about to the point where we get to do that fun, very social thing and start taking questions. If you've got questions, please pose them on Twitter or uh, feel free to make your way down here. I'm going to pose one more myself while I still have the opportunity. Um, uh, with We the People, uh, again, it's a making question since this is his baby in some ways. <laughs> one, um, team. one team. One team. One team, one voice. Um, w one of the uh, uh, constitutionally protected things we have is to um, petition government, right? It's, it's actually in the Constitution since now we can e-petition government. Um, uh, but uh, by saying you respond, you actually go beyond the document itself. There's, there's nothing in there that, I, that I, at least as I read it, that says we have to say something <laughs> back. And, but you decided to do that if you get to a certain point. But there isn't anything in there that says you have to change policy, right? It, it just says that, you know, we can, we can ask you to do something and um, if we collectively ask by the number of politicians then, uh, uh, that, that support us, that we voted for, that helps. The number of updates, hmm, I don't know. Um, there have been a lot of backlashes over the last five years now uh, online. And you can go back through the case studies of Motrin Moms, you know, or, or different, different places where a, a, a company in the private sector 
has screwed up, either with an ad or the customer service uh, situation gone wrong or an employee that freaked out. Um, something bad happened, and they didn't really understand that the internet would make it worse, right? So the video went up online. Um, somebody said something callous. Uh, we see politicians either um, getting tripped up like George Allen or tripping themselves up like Congressman <laughs> Weiner. Um, the, um, the question in this context <laughs> is, uh, at what point do you think uh, social media, in whatever form it, it evolves towards, is actually going to be tied to policy, either in legislation or in the executive? We will we'll ignore the right. Supreme Court because they don't tweet. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. I do, I recognize that this is a baby step, though I, I would like to recognize, in my opinion, it, it's, you have to start somewhere. So to respond to people's inquiries is a first step. I think the challenge, there, there's, there's two challenges, in my opinion, uh, of how do you really integrate citizen input into policy making. One, one is about timing. How do you actually get people involved at the right moment of that policy making cycle? Uh, and we're not, we're not there yet. Uh, and, and, the, and the second piece, and I'm sure there's more pieces, is sort of that information asymmetry. You know, how do you ensure that the collective input and every and, and the policymakers are all sharing the same uh, level set of information? So not all input essentially can be created equal, if you will, if you know, people only know half the story when you're having the conversation. So I, I don't have the answer, of course, right now of how do you, how do you find that information symmetry, but I think it, at least you'd have to think about those pieces. I think the timing piece is a lot easier, and we can do a lot, a lot to do that. Uh, quickly and, and, and fairly easily. Uh, the latter, I don't, I don't pretend to have an answer to today. Thank you. All right, <coughs> now we get social. So uh, <laughs> come on over. Can you introduce yourself, please? Good, after good evening. My name is James Neal. I am currently an MLS student at the University of Maryland studying to become an academic librarian. I am frequently um, talking about the future of the internet and a big active user of social media. One of the things that I find that we often don't talk about as we talk about the future of the internet and social media is how many people are not online. Mm -hmm. How do we talk about the future of the internet and the future of social media when you want to discuss people who may not have laptops, people who may not have broadband, people who may not have access to Wi-Fi? Uh, what role can social media play and what is the future of making more people connected? Great question. Uh, I think the Pew Internet tells us uh, stats currently 79% of this country is online. That's a lot of people who aren't yet. Would anyone like to field that one? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, no. I, well, yeah. one thing that I, I, you know, that I could say is that um, we've had years and years of reaching out to people not online and not through social media, and we're actually really good at it. We've had a, a lot of uh, you know, years to, to work on it. So we have great outreach that isn't online. And uh, what's new to us is the social media, and that's why we, we're putting emphasis on it now, is learning that, catching up, and, and ex excelling at that in the same ways that we do offline. Anyone else? Hmm? I, you know, I'll just throw this out. Uh, uh, Congress is about to um, uh, outlaw net neutrality, um, and uh, we could use some help in, um, in regulating the providers of the tubes through which our internet flows to encourage them to fulfill on their uh, responsibility to, um, responsibility once they took the money from the government to actually um, extend the internet to all corners of, of this country. But, you know, that's what I think, so. Question on digital divide to you. I think our policy folks would clobber me if I misrepresented. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take that one a little bit then. Um, <laughs> I, uh, Pew Internet is a great source of statistics. Uh, I, I think they're, they're working on um, 
cataloging the d digital age as it evolves. And one of the things that um, their researchers shared with me uh, is that the participation rates uh, of um, some of the parts of our, our population which have been traditionally disempowered are higher on social media than other demographics. And uh, that that is true. You've, uh, equal levels of participation across socioeconomic levels on these networks. And if you don't want, if you want evidence of that, I would suggest you go look at trending topics on Twitter. Okay, they are not being defined by CNN or by the New Yorker or by any other kind of broadcast or elite media. They are being defined by a conversation which is going on constantly in the cities and in parts of the population which traditionally don't get a say. They're not being connected to conversations about government. That's a challenge for people who are doing citizen engagement, is to actually connect that particular back channel. But there is an interesting opportunity right now where you have people using social media who uh, are participating in it, in it uh, who have access to the internet only through their phones throughout the world. And uh, there is something very important happening around smartphones. A third of the country has them now. At a replacement rate of 20% a year, we can figure that half of the country will have them by the end of next year, and then we can extrapolate what happens from there. Um, there's now uh, increasingly inexpensive Android phones around the world, uh, so people can get internet access on them. I'd suggest you look at what's happening in Kenya, for instance, where people are getting uh, internet uh, through their phones and through no other way. And we're talking about 98% of the country that has internet gets it through their device there. I mean, mind boggling. Um, that means that uh, social media actually uh, provides different opportunities to get to disadvantaged populations and empower the disempowered than previous networks did. And for anyone who's making government policy or thinking about urban planning, that's probably a pretty important demographic to reach to. Next question. Thank you. My name is Joanne Newhouse. Um, and this is just slightly off topic, but since I have the experts there, they can probably help me out. I know that Facebook was filtering things, and so does Google. And it really bothers me because I just don't want to get what I have because I know what I have already. I want to get what I don't have. How do you reach these people? I, you know how to reach them because you're experts and they depend on you. But I, as an ordinary citizen, who does like to play Sherlock Holmes every now and then with my work on solving problems, that's what I do for a living, I can't find them. So how do ordinary citizens reach the people to tell them, hey, stop filtering your answers when I Google something. I want to know something. I don't want to know what I know about cooking or art or something, I'm, or theater or, or urban planning or architecture, things that I'm familiar with. I want to find out that other half but maybe I have to go to page 100 first, but I'd like to find it out up front or in some order other than what they're giving it to me. So how do you reach the folks who are doing the social networking? How does an ordinary person reach them? Do you mean reach the people who are Like send them platforms? an email, like send them an email, like say, hey, you're doing something that is, <laughs> you're doing something that is not great. And, how, and please, if you want to do it for someone else, that's fine, but don't do it for me. I mean, in other words, as an ordinary citizen, I can't reach the people who are operating Google. You can, because they're trying to reach you. So one of the things that I see as a problem is that these companies are not, uh, oh, they, they don't provide access to the ordinary population, to the regular population who are using them. OK. Uh, so to articulate, how do you hold the people who are creating these platforms accountable for how they uh, do search? Is that a, a good way of re-articulating that? So uh, can I try um, dividing this into two questions and giving brief answers to both of them? Go uh, for it. OK, so um, first question is, how does an ordinary citizen um, reach these companies? And they've given up on customer support, so those channels simply don't work. There is no good answer to this question. It is a huge problem, and it's part of the problem that our social networks are owned by uh, proprietary commercial entities that actually don't care that much um, and so, you, you know, th that's, that is the problem. The, the ways that people have on occasion reach them is by using their own tools to gather a set of people who make an uproar and so Facebook finally says, oh, but that rarely works. It works on occasion, it rarely works, it's very hard to do. 
The second uh, point that um, you raise is about the actual issue of, of social filtering. And I, I want to say something really briefly about that, which is from the point of view of a Facebook, um, there's something uh, very compelling about the idea of using your, they know who your friends are, of course, right? So to use those people as a filter to um, decide what news will be filtered through to you, because people who are like you, they're same interests, and so you'll get that stream. And there's total sense in doing that, but they run into exactly the problem that you're pointing at, which is if you do that, you are using your, your we humans tend to cluster around people who are like us, and this is just the way we are, but it's also a terrible problem. This is the homophily, the, the love of the same, that restricts our imagination and, and our compassion. When you are filtered through the people who are like you, that's an extremely effective filter, which is exa exactly the problem. So I would, in my uh, ideological hopes, which I have no ability to impress upon <laughs> Facebook or Google, I would much rather see Facebook decide to filter news to me based upon what my friends like and what a whole set of people I don't like um, are reading. Yeah. But they don't see a commercial interest in that because by including disparate opinion, they raise the po increase the possibility that they will send me something that is upsetting to me, is disturbing to me, but that's exact, which is bad for their business, but is, would be really great for our democracy. And if I could make them do it, I would, but then, you know. I think you got it. You can also use tools uh, that uh, more, more uh, anonymize you when you surf. You can even, even uh, something, um, a number of browsers give you uh, secret mode or incognito mode as that they called on Chrome. So you are browsing without being personalized in the same way. Right. Uh, if, you, if you look for incognito mode and load up Chrome, you'll be able to browse the internet without being personalized to in the same way. Um, there are also a number of other tools that allow you to connect to the internet anonymously that have become quite important to people in other countries. Uh, if they're uh, uploading, say, video of violent revolutions in places where doing so would mean you, you get killed, um, such as uh, the Tor project um, that allow you to connect anonymously and, and not have the same level of personalization. So there, there, are, there are, are options to, for you in that realm. I'm going to take a question off the internet since I said I would do that. Uh, it's a question from uh, DR, uh, DG Green, Daniel Green, uh, who is a Cornell food psychology student, who asks, what do you see Apple Siri disrupting next? Siri oh, says, answer my question. <laughs> I still want to know what a food psychologist yeah, what, is. Yeah, what is that? Uh, Daniel, do you want to answer the uh, <laughs> So, Thank you for the question you. and the answer. And, and shortcutting people who are standing in the aisle. If, if, I, <laughs> if, if I said I'm going to take questions, I've got to do it. All right. And he asked before they got there, so I'm uh, keeping track. Yeah. Uh, do, do we want to take a question on Apple and social media? Apple's not very social. I mean, what's been written about the, the, the first easiest change, right, is it'll probably disrupt a little bit of text messaging, you know? Walking and texting, driving and texting. Uh, that's probably the, f the first one, but that, that, that's an easy one. You guys have better ones? <laughs> I've got one. Apple's building uh, its ability to message with each other, right? That, that's going to disrupt some of it. Um, this idea that it's good, they're going to use the, the geolocation features of the phone itself so that you can know where your family and friends are, potentially. Um, at, as soon as that happened, uh, the founders of Goala and Foursquare and the rest of those networks went whoop, mm -hmm. because that's, that means it's built in, it's baked into the hardware itself. So that a Apple could theoretically, with its you know, over 100 million iOS devices, 20 million iPads, however many iPhones will be sold by the next of year, I mean they they could bake what we think of as social into the hardware itself. With, uh, uh, and with all the, the ways that Apple tends to work, it would probably be beautifully designed and be wonderfully interoperable and not let you talk to any other service. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So, next question. All right. I'm Katie Filbert. Uh, I'm with Wikimedia DC, the local chapter here. 
And uh, my question is for Pamela, and just want to um, say like how like delighted I am that you're engaging with students on challenge.gov, mm -hmm. and just I can vouch for how wonderful like a resource the EPA photos are from the 1970s, and as they are in the public domain, they, many have been used on Wikipedia. So now that like you're having like students upload photographs or like I don't know if it'll be videos or what, um, like. Do you know what like the copyright of these will be? Like, will they be public domain, Creative Commons, or what? So like people can use them or not or what? And that's a great question. And I think they're all public domain. Uh, I need to verify with the people that are putting on that challenge. But you know, everything that we do when we're putting it up online is all public domain. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. My question's for Ms. Bernard. Uh, I used to work. Hi. Hi. I used to work uh, at the Ohio Secretary of State's office with uh, communications and new media, and now I work here with NOAA. Cool. And my question would primarily be, we spend all of our time, all of our professional day, thinking of new ways to engage every John and Jane Doe out there. But what is it when we have so we have such an overhaul of messages coming into us, what is it that you find engaging? I mean, you, you rack your brain thinking, how are we going to connect to everyone? How does the public connect to you and to your team with the White House? We do it. We don't have a perfect solution for that. So we. I guess I should say, what makes it, what do you find interesting? What's the aha moment that comes into you when you spend all of your time trying to make the public have an aha moment? <laughs> What's different and engaging that inspires you from the public, I guess? Sometimes it's the volume, sheer volume of, of response. Uh, sometimes it is genuinely new ideas that we hadn't thought of. Uh, we put a call out today. We have a program called Advise the Advisor. I don't know if you've been following. The president's been uh, talking a lot about uh, executive actions that he can do to um, help create jobs uh, without congressional help. Um, and we put out a public call for ideas for executive actions and just honestly seeing quality of ideas come in mm -hmm. um, when sometimes you're, s I was surprised that uh, many citizens could distill and understand what an executive action kind of idea might be. Uh, and sometimes I get really excited when we are touching a group or a group has found us that we have not spoken with before or thought about before and when we're a little daring you know I got excited uh, we did just a simple program with monster.com for example uh, to talk about the economy and jobs I mean the, you know and we're not and, and went straight to people looking for jobs to talk about jobs so when we can find connections uh, from people who aren't in Washington, it, it's pretty great. Can I ask a, uh, Did that answer it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, can, can I ask a quick question? So I assume yeah. that the first 600 petitions that you got were legalized marijuana. Uh, what no. else do you find depressing about uh, the interaction that you get? Uh, you know, I don't think it's depressing. <laughs> I actually love that um, petitions are a great way for very niche you know, interest groups to organize and get to us. You know, when, when, when I'm spending 11 hours of my 20 hour work day thinking about jobs in the economy, it's nice, it's kind of great to get a petition reminding you that people care about UFOs and <laughs> marijuana <laughs> and, uh, and whatever it may be. So, uh, We've, we've seen a lot of everything. But believe it or not, um, you know, you still get the big picture. So roughly a third of the petitions that have come in are still around jobs and the economy issues. Uh, to yeah. follow up with it, there's a quick question that's posed to you on contests and, and uh, works being put in the public domain. The, the analog to that would be if uh, submissions to contests were applications, they would be open source which is to say that uh, they would be available for the public to be uh, to reuse for a certain amount of time. And we're seeing a number of different application contests around the country that that's the, uh, the direction that they're taking, which is to say that if uh, you do something in that realm, that you contribute it, and then other people can reuse the code. So just an important principle to point out there. 
Uh, Marcy Harris. Hello. Uh, I'm a recovering congressional staffer and now working <laughs> on a company called Popbox that's actually a platform to help people weigh in on issues before Congress. And one of the things that we're noticing, uh, you know, when, when we started working on the project, it was my experience as a congressional staffer being on the receiving end and thinking, wouldn't it be great if all of these stories were public and they weren't just going into the black box of a congressional office, but others could see the stories, could share the stories, could understand the points of view of others. Uh, and, and that's definitely catching on, but we're also seeing that people are not just weighing in on one issue that they might have written a letter to Congress about uh, years ago. Now they want recommendations of the next thing they should weigh in on and, and other issues that are taking place, and they want to know what's on the floor next week. And uh, they want to know, you know, who, now they want to follow people and see who, you know, people they respect their comments, what they're having to say. And so we're, we're seeing enormous demand to allow citizens to be constantly engaged on what's happening in Congress and really provide a place for that to happen. I was on the Hill today, and I have a lot of sympathy, uh, talking about, um, I and mean, we try to make sure that the messages that we're sending to Congress go into systems you know, as easily as possible. They're tagged with bills, numbers, and, and support oppose, and, and other tagging ways to get them automatically into the congressional system. But the increase in, in input last year to Congress was 500%. The year before that, it was 800%. The year before that, I think it was similar. And it's going to exponentially grow. And I don't think we're going to see any diminished amount of people wanting to be involved in government. I think that's only going to increase. Um, and I think it's a wonderful thing. And I think it goes to your data question of, of people becoming involved. Um, and also the timing question of how that's incorporated into policy. But to get to the question, and I apologize for the long introduction, uh, the, the, the question is, do you think that if people are weighing in more and there's, there's much more of uh, an impact on policy from the district, from, from a member of Congress, or from the greater country, that you will also see those that we think of as influencers in Washington, whether it's lobbyists or advocates or associations or organizations, et cetera, spending more of their time educating the population about their issues as opposed to focusing in on Washington? <laughs> oh, that was for me? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's for you. <laughs> oh, I'm not taking it. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, it's anyone's guess, right? I mean, that's a terrible answer, but... I suppose it would depend I'm just trying to think, if I, was, if I was running one of these organizations, I would answer that question based on how well I, I was already penetrated in Washington and what is my clout in Washington already. And if I'd sort of made as many inroads as I could there and felt that I had the power base, then you build the concentric circle out. Um, and I'm not sure it's an either or. Wouldn't you want to do you'd want to hit everything you can, right? So you're saying that Jack Ab Abramoff wouldn't have been concerned about his cloud score? I think he would. <laughs> I think okay. he would. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, question, right? P please let us know who you are. Hi. My name is Catherine Miss, and I'm writing my thesis on this, so thank you for having this event. Um, <laughs> it's off the record. <laughs> Too late. Breaking my heart. Also, I don't have service. I would have tweeted it in. Um, how do you get citizens to cross that line between basic participation, uh, a like on Facebook, a retweet, um, to get actual mobilization? to uh, motivate citizens to act, whether it be getting someone to like President Obama on Facebook to get them to campaign for him, or like uh, an interest group getting them to like nature versus getting them to get out there and start an event, start a meeting or something about the pipeline. You know what I mean? How do you, how do you get them to cross that line? I'll, I'll start to answer it, but then I actually think, Pam, you're going to be a better person to answer this. And I was really surprised, personally, when I came to work at the White House. Um, you know, from the White House perch, uh, we do less in the citizen services area. You know, we are heavy on communications and heavy on policy. 
Um, but we start to get into legal areas about we are not out organizing folks the same way a campaign would. Um, and when you're trying to help folks with citizen services and answer their issues, you start to get into agency, agency world. So um, we spend less time urging people to take action, a specific action. It's, it's really more about tell us what you think get you closer to administration officials. So I, I think you, you're probably better at this one. Well, so uh, I think the question that you asked, the way you said it was how do you get people to act? And I think maybe that's not, it's the framing of that question. What I'm seeing anyway is how do you get your agency to realize that there are people that are dying to work with you and help you and, and be involved? We have people coming in on Saturdays scanning for two hours, and you know we, we have some donuts or something for them. But you know these are people that are really interested. There are I know we have not tapped into everybody who's very interested. There's there are groups in the area, the um, the German American uh, societies. There's uh, people that are interested in, in Civil War reenactors. There's all kinds of topics that folks are interested in. And they're just trying to find a way. They, they don't even know, are you interested in working with us? And you start talking to them. When we got Wikipedia involved, just the enormous enthusiasm. Um, last year, in one of our first events, 120 people showed up. I, I was stunned. And they're all like, tell, tell us how we can help. So I don't, I don't think it's getting people, at least at, at our agency, it hasn't been that. It's been us realizing, hey, we should start working with these people. And how do we do that? And I hate to be an old timer about this. But I can't help it, you know, it's the way it is. Um, I think there's lessons still from uh, previous camp election campaigns, including the Howard Dean campaign, where um, uh, people were moved to go from the social networking to out into the street to actually uh, do work in the real world um, through engagement with other people. Um, that's why, uh, again, to be old timey, although Meetup is still a very active and wonderful yeah. organization. Um, Meetup at the time came to prominence because people realized, the Dean campaign realized um, that, oh, actually getting people in a room together is a really important step in getting them out of that room and in, into the streets. And uh, um, people to people is, you know, pretty powerful. Yeah. Last question. Hi, my name is Jane R. Stewart, and I live in the Bethesda area. Um, I was just uh, interested um, in asking um, you, Sarah, about um, kind of how you guys are paying attention to some of this alternative media and stuff that's generated from the people. Because um, my friends, for example, get really frustrated with the mainstream media and how it seems to really miss the boat on what we think, believe, and feel. And um, it's some would even say that the Herman Cain campaign is like a response to that, that like people are, are kind of giving him poll numbers in a way to sort of say to the media, you're not representing us, and yet the issues that are out there, put out there by the media are always what gets heard. Um, one of the things I found frustrating when uh, Obama apologized for, um, you know, not getting enough response on his job bill as if somehow that was his fault. So it's like, I'm wondering, how are you guys measuring what people really feel, and are these social media um, avenues giving you a means to do that? Uh, it's a great question. Are you, when you say alternative media, are you just saying online as alternative? Alternative to Fox, CNN, ABC. Yeah. <laughs> Non-news. Uh, you know, we're, it, it's, it's an interesting question because we start to enter um, the church and state of what's appropriate for the campaign to do versus what would be appropriate for the administration to do. So, uh, you know, if we were Coca-Cola, we would probably buy a social media monitoring service and we would be out looking at sentiment analysis of what, um, you know, what everyone on Twitter is saying before a speech, after a speech, during a speech, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you're probably not that comfortable with the White House doing that, despite the fact that that's public information. So we, we, aren't, on the, we aren't on that edge of social media monitoring. Um, it's just not the right time uh, for us to get into that. It feels a little too big brother to the big brother illusion earlier. Um, so we are doing it 
the good old 2001 old fashioned way. We are doing online news clips. We are uh, looking at volume of comments, pluses and negatives and likes and, and that sort of thing. And um, literally a small team of us rolling up our sleeves saying, hey, hey, you know, this is what's happening on the internet. You know, and, uh, and we have a voice in the building and it works. Okay, uh, I think I'm getting my, my little voice in my ear here. I feel like I, I'm <coughs> escorting POTUS around. Uh, it says it's, it is uh, 8.31, <laughs> which means we've come to the end of our forum. Uh, I feel like we could keep asking questions here for a long time. I'm really grateful to everyone who asked one tonight, and of course, to all of you in the back channel who have been busily documenting what people have been saying all along. Uh, I think it's a great example of social media in action. Uh, you can certainly find me if you have follow-up questions at Digifile on Twitter. He is D Weinberger. You are Pamela S W. Um, you are not on Twitter yet. No, I gave up my my social media life when I joined the White House. Okay, um, but <laughs> I there assume was only downside. Maybe for if me. people have a, a question for you, they my can start. My email is sperinard at who.eop.gov. And I was going to say do a petition, but that's even. And it better. will be on the. It will be. It will be archived okay. <laughs> as part of the Presidential Records Act. Okay. Right. So thanks again. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for everything else. Have a good night.